We, are, uh, we finished uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. We roll into the historical books, uh, which uh, start here in the book of Joshua. If you have a Bible, you want to open up to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, and we'll look at chapter 1 tonight. We also are going to be having communion uh, towards the, at the end of our service. Uh, last, uh, not last week, the week before, I had been asked to speak at a leadership conference in Boise, Calvary Chapel. And they have a leadership conference every year. And I had been given a, a topic, and um, I was working on my message, and uh, my wife was taking care of some things in the mall. So she was in the mall. I was working on my message. That's, like, that's what we call m and mall message. Works great. I have something to do. She's doing something. And she was in the mall, and uh, it was a Saturday, so the Boise Mall was really full. I pulled my car as far away, uh, away from the mall as I could get. And I found a spot where there's about 10 empty parking spots. I, I pulled my car underneath the shade. And as I uh, am prone to do, when I am thinking about a message, I like to walk. I'm a, I'm a pacer. And I walk back and forth, and I have a notebook in my hand, and I'm praying, and I'm thinking, and I'm praying, and I'm thinking, and I'm writing down things. And uh, uh, I usually have a tremendous, I don't know it because I'm just in my own little world, but I have this tremendous look of consternation or, you know, concentration. And uh, so as I'm walking back in my little 10 spaces and I'm going back and forth and I've got my notebook and I'm kind of working on point one of my message, working on point two of my message, and I'm kind of stuck about point three. And, and right then, lo and behold, the guy in the, in the mall cop car, the, the rent-a-cop, okay, the guy in his, his mall cop car, he's got his lights going. And he pulls over it, uh, to me as if he's making a bust of the grand proportions. Okay? Now, he's a security guy. I realize he's got a job to do. And I, my wheels start spinning really fast. I probably look like a real oddball. I've got this notebook. I'm going back and forth. He probably thinks I'm casing the jewelry joint in there or something or getting ready to be some body bomb or some crazy thing. And I, I realized how odd I must have looked, especially with this, you know, stone look on my face. And I'm walking back and forth. And, and he pulls up and he's got his lights going on. And he said, you've got my curiosity. He had a real strong accent. He said, you've got my curiosity up. And I said, I do? He said, yeah. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a pastor, and I've been asked a, to speak in this leadership conference um, tomorrow morning, and I'm kind of stuck on point three. So uh, we started joking. I said, why don't you help me out? What, what should I say to the leadership conference on leadership tomorrow morning? He said, tell them to forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and when he said it, he gave me this big grin, and he was toothless. He had about four teeth in his head. And <laughs> it was really a comical moment. He's got his lights going. He doesn't have any teeth. And I asked him for his input on the leadership conference, and he said, you just tell him to forget it. And I'm like, tell him to forget leadership? He said, yeah, tell him to forget leadership. And then he, he drove off and was content that I wasn't a dangerous individual. But I thought about that. I thought, that is, that is really, that is really apropos. When it comes to the cost of leadership and the price of leadership and the responsibility of leadership and the burden of leadership, most people just say, forget it. It's not worth it. Why have all the hassle? Why have, uh, you know, manage a business? Why, why do this or that? I had a friend, and, and he, was a, he was a very diligent soul himself. And he kept being asked uh, by his supervisor, we need to promote you so that you can be a manager. He said, I don't want to manage. I've done it before. I know what it entails. It entails people. I don't ever want to manage again. What did, he was saying, just forget it. It's a drag. If you've worked uh, in a place where you've been given responsibility and you go from being a peer that's just a buddy in work to responsibility and now leadership and you've got to ask who was your former buddy, hey, man, get to work on time and get your job done. That's, that's leadership. And when we look, turn to Joshua, especially chapter 1, we have our message entitled tonight, Encouragement for Leaders. Because you know what? It's no picnic. It's, it's, uh, it's got its ups, it's got its downs, it's got its pros and its cons, it's got its rewards and it's got its 
um, drawbacks, if you will. And Joshua really needs some encouragement because no doubt the little voice of insecurity in his own brain was saying, just forget it, man. Who needs this? He watched how the people treated Moses. 40 years I'm whining and complaining and just belly aching. And he saw everything that Moses went through. And now the Lord taps him and says, you're the new guy, Joshua. Huh? Uh, come on. Now, I mean, no, uh, he's ready. Don't get me wrong. He, he's, he doesn't beg off. He doesn't make excuses. I want to lay out just a really short introduction to this book. And I want you to know what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to go in and take the promised land. I don't mean a little territory of turf called Israel. I mean in your own spiritual walk. You see, the Old Testament has what we call types or typology. And as you look at the Old Testament, it has pictures that are snapshots of what the Christian life should become. And the book of Joshua is about a victorious Christian life, if you will, if we look at the typology of it. This is how the type leads us up to this place. And I just want to share it with you real quick. The children, the children of Israel, a, peop, uh, a picture of the people of God, were in a place called Egypt, a picture and a type of the world. They were in bondage to a fierce fellow by the name of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan and the bondage that he keeps people in their sins. But a deliverer shows up, a guy by the name of Moses. The Lord Jesus is our ultimate deliverer that leads us out of sin, out of the bondage and the burden of a guy by the name of Satan and leads us out. Now, as soon as you come out of the world into a new walk with God, what do you usually do? In Christianity, you follow Christ in baptism. Well, the Lord baptized an entire nation in one felt swoop. He took them through, and the Bible calls it the baptism of Moses. He takes them through the Red Sea on dry ground. But if you saw the water and you saw them, they would disappear into the water and come up the other side, a picture of baptism. Then they end up in a place called the wilderness. Now, they were only supposed to be in the wilderness a short time before they went into the promised land, but... Um, they stayed 40 years in the wilderness. Well, what is the wilderness a picture of? It's a picture of those who, in our New Testament spiritual sense, about people who come to Christ, they get baptized, they follow the Lord, they get their Bible, they get their bumper sticker, they get their cross necklace, they get all their memorabilia, they're three weeks in, and now they realize they've got 40 years to go. And what happens is that many people don't discover how to get to the promised land they wander around with a saved soul, but an unproductive spiritual life. They don't get into God's word. They don't get into prayer. They don't, they don't discover the promises of God. It's called the promised land, as we'll see here, because God had promised it to Abraham. But what's a picture of the promised land for the Christian? A picture of the promised land for us is we get into our relationship with God, we discover this, the Bible, the wonderful book of God's promises, and we look at the New Testament and we see all the promises that God has for us, and we step into those promises by faith and begin to add them to our li lives, and we begin to expand spiritually in our own maturity and our own growth. I've known people that have been saved for 20 years, and their life is stunted. When we look at this picture... We want to see the expansive picture of what God has for the children of Israel and what he has for you and I. Ultimately, they get to the Red Sea, and, or excuse me, as we're going to see here, they're going to get to the Jordan. What's the picture of the Jordan? If they came through the baptism of Christ and they were in the wilderness, they shouldn't have stayed there so long. A lot of people died there. But they were to go on to the promised land. They went through the baptism of the Jordan. What's that? It's a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, life in the Spirit. The promised land is a picture of a full Full dimensional Christian life. It's not as the old, old hymns. They got it wrong. And that is the promised land is a picture of heaven. Oh, no, man, there's all kinds of battle and worrying and fighting going on in heaven. Not so. For, aren't you looking forward to heaven because the conflict's over? Right, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more temptation, no more bummer. We're looking forward. If you've had a bad week, you are longing for heaven more than the rest of us. You're like, come, Lord Jesus. Right? But the promised land is a picture of the full, vibrant Christian life where there's a lot of battles. There's a lot of, we're in spiritual warfare, right? So that's a snapshot. So this is what the Lord's going to say, and he's going to give it to us in this passage. I'll rehearse a little bit. He, the Lord, defines the boundaries of the promised land. 
God has divine, defined the boundaries of the promised land for the children of Israel. Let's say it's this big. It goes in the north to Lebanon. It goes in the south all the way down to Egypt. It has the barrier on the west of the Mediterranean Sea. And what is going to be the far eastern, kind of eastern and northern, northeastern boundary is going to be the Euphrates River. Whoa, it's a huge territory compared to what it is today. Let's say it's this big, just for a visual. The children of Israel, what did they accomplish? About that much. God said, this is, this is what I have for you. This is what they took. Only under two kings did they experience the full boundaries. David, who was a man after God's own heart. Who experienced the fullness of the Christian life? The man after God's own heart. The woman after God's own heart that presses in and discovers the promises of God and begins to apply them to his life. So only under David and Solomon. But Solomon, David, you know, David fought all the battles and Solomon took the spoil. He, he really didn't get it. David got it and gave it to Solomon and then Solomon lost it. And then Rehoboam, his son, it was divided in, even in half, even smaller. So if you look at the, the nation of Israel today, about 50 to 70 miles wide and about 300 uh, miles long, it's not what God intended. I look at a lot of people, Christians' lives and God has so much more for them. They're not living the life God intended. God has a full, full dimensional Christian life. So the book of Joshua, and this is the beautiful thing. Moses had to die the, next, the last time we saw Moses. He went up on a mountain and he died. And the Lord buried him because Moses, under the law, couldn't bring the children of Israel into the promised land. He couldn't lead them into the promised land. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth from our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what's Jesus' name in the Hebrew? It's Joshua. Jesus is the great Joshua that can bring us into the full dimensional life that God has ordained. That's what Jesus said, did he not? He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. You live in the abundant life? Are you abiding in Christ? Are you pressing in and laying hold of the promises of God that God has for you so that your life is just ebbing in dimensions as far as growth? You maybe have been walking with the Lord for a long time. The Bible says deep calls unto deep. Meaning the Lord has deep truths. And I don't mean secret mysterious truths that nobody's come up with. I simply mean a greater application and laying hold of by faith of the promises that are plain and simple that God has for you and me. Well, that's a mini introduction. Hopefully we have time for a message and communion. Okay. So we're going to look at, basically there's 10 things. I'm not going to, I always forget the numbers. So um, I'm just going to, if you're a good note taker, you'll get it. First off, if, if you want to have encouragement for uh, leadership, obviously you need a good leader to encourage. And in this case, the Lord has a good leader. It says in verses 1 and 2, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you might say that's obvious. No, it's not obvious because the Lord took Moses all by himself up on Mount Nebo uh, and he looked across and he looked to the west, he looked to the, the north and the south. He looked and saw the whole land that God had promised for Israel and then he died. And then the Lord supernaturally buried him. And I shared with you the last time we were together in the book of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 34 that as uh, he was buried that that Michael the archangel and Satan actually got in a, a, a spiritual battle. Uh, read the book of Jude. It's kind of mysterious to us over the body of Moses. So uh, nobody knows where Moses' tomb or burial spot was. Now, why would the Lord do that? Well, Moses was such an incredible leader. No doubt the children of Israel would have worshipped his grave rather than worshiping the true and the living God. God just takes Moses out of the equation so that can't even happen. And so now that Moses is dead, he's away from Joshua. He's away from everybody. Nobody knows. So the Lord just tells Joshua, hey, Moses is dead. He's come home to be with me. And I like how Moses is described. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Do you know the word, though, I'm sharing with you a title and a message, encouragement for leaders, that, that God's message... God's message to leaders is your servants. 
Um, throughout the scriptures, when you talk about God's leaders, he calls them his servant. And we get this whole idea of a servant leader from that. And Moses was a great servant. And he's now dead. So you have the transition of leadership here in verses 1 and 2. Transition of leadership. You have a very, very, very uh, unbelievable leader, really, in a category all by himself, Moses. And the transition of leadership now is handed off to Joshua. In verse 2, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Now, in order to have uh, encouragement in a, as a servant and as a leader, you need a plan. You need a strategy, right? I mean, what's a leader going to do out without a plan? Where are you going to take people that are following you? you? You need a strategic plan. And so the Lord gives that to him. He says, hey, I'm giving this land uh, to the children of Israel. And then he describes it. He not only describes the boundaries, as I shared with you in the introduction, we have the Lebanon in the north, we have Egypt in the south, we have the Mediterranean on the west, and we have that great river Euphrates. But the land that is in between all of those boundaries is the land of the Hittites or the Canaanites or the Girgashites or, uh, you know, all the ites, the flashlights, all the ites that are in this land, flashlights, termites, they're all there and they're going to wipe them all out. So, one of the things that is really important for encouragement and leadership is knowing the boundaries that God has given you. What are your boundaries? What has God given you? What are the areas of influence that you have? I realize for me and what God has called me to in my life that I have, I have boundaries in my life. I have relational boundaries. Um, I have uh, a boundary in this uh, primary relationship, humanly speaking, in my wife, uh, in my grown adult married children. Okay, I have a, a sphere of, of family boundary. I have a sphere of uh, ministry boundary. This is what God's called me to do, to be here. I'm just a, I'm a local pastor. Some pastors are kind of missionaries that travel the world or they're conference speakers or they're this. Basically, my, I'm a pastor teacher. That's what I'm, I like to be home. Uh, I like to be with you guys. I like to study and pray and share God's word and love God's people. It's really simple. These are the boundaries of my life. Now, God has pushed out those boundaries as he continues to uh, bring greater ministry opportunities just through faithfulness and it's little, you know, baby steps to see things get bigger. But I have boundaries in my life. I also have uh, boundaries when it comes to time management. I can only do so much in a day. Uh, I only do so much in a week, and that's the way I just work, is I work at, I look at things in a weekly way, what I want to accomplish, what I want to do, and, uh, and I have a pattern, you know, most of us have patterns. I, I, I start at home, and I have my breakfast, and I come to church, and after church, I might stop by Walmart or Winco, and then I go home, and then I, you know, I go to church, and then I go home, and then I go do a wedding, I go to a funeral, and then I go to Winco or Walmart, and I go home, and I just, you know, I stop by Bucks, you know, I go to the gas station at Bucks, and I get some, you know, gas there, and I have my little routine, I have my little boundary, and some people call that rut. I call it delightful routine. I like routine. I, I, I function best on a schedule, you know what I mean? You, when I, that's the hard thing when you travel and you do conference speaking or you're going from uh, this hotel to that hotel and you're, you're um, I'm all discombobulated. I'm out of, where's Bucks for gas? Where's Walmart? You know, I got to find the first Walmart and find my first gas station so I start getting in my rhythm of things. So, uh, but you have boundaries. You have vocational boundaries. You know, what has God called you to do as a, as a job? Uh, where is your geographical boundaries? So here the leader gets a plan. He gets the north boundary. He gets the western boundary. He gets the southern boundary. He gets the eastern and northeastern boundary. And then as if to say if I miss something, the Lord tells him in verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, 
I have given you, as I said to Moses. Now, how do I apply that in my Christian life? Well, first of all, God defines the boundaries of my life. But everything that I discover in the promises of God in the scriptures that I believe and I appropriate to my life by faith, I put my foot. Everywhere my foot steps, God's going to give that to me. Whether it's an area of my life that I'm struggling in sin, the Lord is going to give me victory over that. As I step there by faith, in the power of God's spirit, in the truth of God's word, I know it is God's will to give me victory in areas of sin or temptation in my life. I understand the promises as I, I once again, step into them that I'm a forgiven person. The Bible says if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So some people might hear that verse. Some Christians are even forgiven people, but they live in a sense of guilt and shame and a lack of appropriation. I share that verse with them. Oh, they go, well, that's a nice verse. Well, you haven't stepped in it. You, you haven't, the sole of your foot doesn't rest there. You see, I live because I believe that verse by faith, that promise, that's a promise. I believe that promise by faith, therefore I live like a forgiven person. It's not that I, you know, uh, that I don't sin or I don't fail or I don't mess up. It's that I know how to get clean after I mess up. It's not like I'm strategizing, how can I get in a season of sin? It's just that I mess up. I might misspeak or say a sharp word. You know what I mean? Things that, so I step into that promise of forgiveness. Now, some people, to add to that, they don't discover that Philippians 3.13 says, forgetting those things that are behind, I press forward in that upward call that is in Christ Jesus. So not only do I experience forgiveness, but I forget what's behind me. That's a, that's a positive thing. I'm, I'm not chained to my past. And I have one. And I, and, and I don't like to go dig around in the garbage back there. I got a lot of stuff in that trash can. I'm not a dumpster diver when it comes to my past. So forgetting those things that are behind. I mean, yesterday's history, man. Tomorrow's a mystery. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't even know if I'm going to live through tonight. An aneurysm can go off in my brain, a heart attack, whatever. I'm, I could be done, right? So tomorrow's a mystery. Yesterday's history, and today is a gift of God. I know people that go through life because they don't know the promises of God. Their soul of their foot doesn't live in that promise of God, that they're chained to their past or they're terrified and paralyzed about the future. Oh, what about, I don't know about tomorrow and next week, and I wonder if we have to gonna have the money, I don't know. They're biting their nails and freaking out. The Lord says, this is a promise. Tomorrow have a, has enough troubles of its own. <laughs> Therefore, I don't, I don't borrow trouble from tomorrow to bring it into today, because today's been a pretty good day. And there might be a big hassle tomorrow, and you know what I've discovered? It's just gonna show up and slap me in the mouth, and I don't have to look for it. I don't have to go, I wonder when that hassle's going to get here. I know it's going to come. Life's been too peachy for the last two weeks. Have you ever feel that way? Life's been so good for the last couple of months, you start looking around like, what's going to go wrong? <laughs> it's fear and insecurity, right? It's fear and insecurity. So if I know that I'm a forgiven person, and if I know that I am too, this is a command, so, uh, Paul goes on in verse 14 to say, as many as mature have this attitude. If you've grown up and you're living in the promised land of the Christian life, you not only experience daily cleansing in forgiveness, so you live like a forgiven person, but you also forget the failure of yesterday or last week or last year or 10 years ago or whatever it is, and you forget it, man. It's going to do you no good. It's a waste of time, effort, and energy. So is worry about tomorrow. Some don't fear about yesterday. It's worry. Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Look at God feeds the birds every day. Isn't it amazing? You, in the morning, it's been so nice. Our windows are open and the birds are just like before the dawn. And they're, on a, they're not out in a conference out there. Oh, I wonder if we're going to have enough seed today. 
they're out there, wow, God's good. He's amazing. He feeds us every day. Wasn't that, you know, wasn't that dead squirrel on the road just great, the magpies are saying? It was a feast. So they're, they're not worried about it. Jesus said, look at the birds. Every time I start worrying about tomorrow, I check out the birds and they're happy and they're singing and they're chirping and they're fluttering and they're just like, well, I should have a song in my heart. Look at the lilies of the field. So i just share with you those three promises. One more, just for fun. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for you if you know Jesus as your Savior. Do you feel condemned? Do you feel heavy? Do you feel weighted down? There's no condemnation. If you feel condemned, where's it coming from? The Bible says, the accuser of the brethren condemns you. He whispers in your ear. So there's no condemnation for me. And if I'm living in the expansive, flourishing, abundant life, the promised land of the Christian life, the sole of my foot is squarely on 1 John 1, 9. I'm a forgiven person. I forget those things that are behind. Philippians 3, 13. Matthew chapter 6. Not worrying about tomorrow. Uh, seek first the kingdom of God. So 30 through 33, talking about that, not worrying. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 1. You see, if you, if you don't know those verses, if you don't appropriate those verses, you live like a person that is unforgiven. You're trapped by your past. Or you're paralyzed for your future. Or you walk around in condemnation. And none of those things are living the promised land, right? So why is the Christian life so vital? Discovering the promises of God and living in the promises of God. Everywhere the sole of your foot goes. That's why it's so important to read the Bible. Read the Bible. Underline those promises. Put circles around it. Highlight. Put a smiley face. Put a star. Whatever you want to do. Bring some attention to that promise and pray it in that day. As I do my daily reading, there might be three or four promises. And I go, wow. It's cool. Now, because I read through the Bible every year and I have the same Bible, I underlined it, you know, three years ago and now I highlight it. Now I put a star and now I got it. You know, I mean, how, how much can I draw attention to it? Because I need this promise in the very fiber of my life. And by faith, God said it. I believe it. I'm going to live it. And that's what separates wilderness, wandering, dried up, unfruitful, unproductive Christians from the flourishing, vibrant, abundant life living believers. Two different categories. The one, save soul, lost life. The other, save soul, abundant life. Have you ever wondered what makes that person different than that person? This is the difference. This is the life-changing, victorious Christian life difference. This is what the Old Testament equivalent of that is. Go get your inheritance, man. Go get your inheritance. It's, it would be as if you received an inheritance from a wealthy uncle of $10 million. And you were a homeless guy living on the street. Somebody comes, the lawyer finds you, tracks you down. There you are on Skid Row. Got your, you know, bottle and he comes over. Are you so-and-so? Yeah. Can I see some idea? Yeah, I got this old driver's license. You're the guy. I just want to inform you that your dead uncle, your distant relative, left you $10 million. Left you everything. Here's a checkbook. All the money's in the bank account. There you go. <laughs> That's great. There you go. Put the checkbook in there, and you keep living like a homeless guy. The other homeless people around you say, hey, didn't you just say that you inherited $10 million? Yeah, but who can believe him? And you got $10 million in the bank and a checkbook that you could write checks on and you never write a one. You see, when you got your Bible, it's a billion dollars worth of promises. All you got to do is discover them, apply them by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit and live them and watch your life change from a shriveled up boundary to an expansive boundary of what God has for you. Don't you want that?
man, I want that. I want that more and more. And you say, well, I've been walking with the Lord for 30 years. So I went for my little seed. I got a little more. But I'm not that. I'm like, let's go for it, man. Got a, I got a couple of more years left. So, Lord willing. Uh, verse 5. Um, but leaders need encouragement in the face of opposition. This is not going to easy be easy. I just told you something wonderful. And you might think it's going to be easy because I said it was wonderful. But look what he says in verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage for to this people and you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So the first thing you realize... What I just told you, as soon as you go, man, I'm going to do it. I want that. I want the expansive land. I want a, a, a vibrant Christian life. I want the promises of God operating in my life. I'm going to do it. Lord, help me. And the devil steps up right away and says, oh, no, you don't. I'm going to take your head off. You're going to have everything that can go wrong, begin to go wrong, and all kinds of spiritual battle because you don't take the promised land without a fight. And that's what the children of Israel are going to discover. They go into the promised land, but it's no cakewalk. But what does the Lord promise? There will be, he tells Joshua, who needed to hear this, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. You and God make the majority, and you can push ahead and experience the promises that God has for you. There is nothing standing in your way except the spiritual battle. Well, first of all, your lack of want to, and the spiritual battle, the devil and his minions, the demons that would keep you from that. And so there's going to be a spiritual struggle to accomplish that. So it's not going to be easy. Number two, the greatest encouragement that a person that's going to go through adversity can hear is that God's presence is going to be with them. He says, I will be with you like I was with Moses. And that was tangible to Joshua. He saw how God was always with his servant, Moses. And he said, just like I took care of Moses, Joshua remembers 40 years worth of data. Yeah. And he said, I will never leave you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. You know that promise is made to you? Just like the God of the universe that took care of Moses, that is going to be with Joshua, that was with David, that was with Noah, that was with Paul the Apostle, that was with John the Baptist, that was with Peter and Andrew, James and John. That God, he promises to be with you by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus promised, he says, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. We see in Hebrews chapter 13 that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. I know no matter what adversity, conflict, stumbling, uh, hardship, whatever I go through, even if I fail in the midst of it, miserably, God is always with me. God is never ashamed of me. He is going to be with me. And so it's that comfort. It's like a little child. The, the most comforting thing to a child that is afraid at night, at bedtime, when you want them to go to sleep, is for the presence of mom and dad. You come and lay down on the bed, right? It's all, everything's sweet. You think, <laughs> their eyes are closed, so you try to ease out of the bed. And they go, where are you going? <laughs> They're not asleep yet, right? Isn't it? I mean, just as a parent, just that whole dynamic of, and, and think about it. Logically, you're in the other room with just a wall. You, you're in your bedroom. They're in their bedroom. There's just a wall behind you. And they're talking, and you're talking about, yes, it's okay. Go to sleep. You don't have to be afraid. Pray. God's with you. I know. But, you know. And they go back. But as soon as you are tangibly, your presence is visible, smellable, touchable, hearable at a whisper, all fears are gone. And it's that comfort that the Lord comes and whispers in Joshua's ear. Huh. Maybe he shouts it with a megaphone. It's not a whisper at all. He says, you know, I was with Moses and I'm, I was with Joshua and I'm going to be with you. All leaders, no matter what their uh, task is, need encouragement. He tells them in verse 6, be strong and of good courage. And then he tells them what the plan is. Once again, the strategy, you're going to divide the land that is an inheritance. I swore to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all got the promise that this land was going to be theirs. So God is fulfilling. That is why it's called the promised land, because God promised it to Abraham back in chapter 12 of Genesis, and he's faithful. Are not, is not Israel still in the land today? 
Now, there was 2,000 years where they were pretty much gone from the land, but God promised it to Abraham, and even to this day, the Israelites were there, are there. And so God's promises are true, even though it's a, um, how should we say, a dwarfed picture of what he intended. A dwarfed picture of what he intended. God had so much more. You know, one of the things for me, understanding these truths from God's word, is I don't want to get to heaven and discover that God has so much more for me. And I just never laid hold of it. I don't want to get to heaven and have that, hey, you know what, I had so much more. Why weren't you more open? Why didn't you press in? Why didn't you see my face? What? Why didn't you discover my promises and apply them to your life? Why didn't you press in and have this expansive Christian experience? Why were you satisfied with this dwarfed, shriveled, eking by existence of faith? I don't want to hear that. I don't want to experience that. Verse 7, a leader needs to... Uh, Never underestimate the importance of obedience. Though there's grace and there's mercy and there's forgiveness for failure, obedience is the marching orders for all of God's people. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, this is important both in verse 7 and in verse 8. He's going to talk about us prospering and, and Joshua being of good success. If you want to prosper in your walk with God, if you want to prosper in life, if you want to be successful in what you are doing, then these are the ingredients to do it. First, you need to be strong and very courageous in your walk with God. And then you need to observe to do according to all the law. Now, you and I are not under the law. We're under a New Testament covenant of the blood of Christ. And this new relationship, we're even going to celebrate that new covenant through uh, his, the, the cup and the bread, a symbol of his bodies and his blood that was shed for us. But this new experience, Jesus put it this way. If you love me, now I just... I mean, it's real simple. You're here on a Wednesday night. Now, some of you have to be here because you drop your kids off for a while. And so you're just, you know, you're on the back row texting. You've got to be here. Well, most of you. How, how many of you, how many of you, just, you love Jesus for what he's done in your life? Look at that. Praise the Lord. Cool. So you love him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The mark of his, he, he says, you know, I love you this much. I, I'm going to let them take all my clothes off, humiliate me in nakedness in public, let them drive spikes through my hands and my feet, brutalize my face, and they're going to kill me. Well, he gives up his own spirit, but he dies on the cross. He goes to the tomb, rises from the dead, and he says, I prove my love for you, and I love you this much that I would go and die on the cross. Now I want you to prove your love to me with your obedience. Yes, there's grace and mercy and there's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. But have a heart because you want to love God, to be obedient. And so Joshua is no different. There's not a human that has a pulse that doesn't need to be encouraged to be obedient. Some of you are here tonight and you've been very disobedient re recently. And you're here and, and you just have that repentance of heart that you want, to, you want to press in because you don't want to live that way anymore. And so he tells us, don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand that you may prosper wherever you go. I realize that in the center of God's will that I discover through his grace and by his mercy and through me seeking to be obedient to him, in the center of his will is where the blessing, the spout where the blessings flow out. And if I am tempted to go to the right hand or to the left hand, I move outside of the realm. It's not that God can't bless me. It's that I remove myself from doing all that God wants to do in my life. Okay, so that's an important distinction because God wants to do so much more in my life, but if I get off to the right or the left. Now, this is fascinating because the Word of God, that's where his, his center line, if you will, is. Don't go to the right hand or the left hand for my instructions. What does it mean to go to the right hand in God's Word and left hand from God's Word? Well, to the right, let's just call that going from a place of grace and obedience to a place of legalism and law. 
You want to go to the right. You, you want to add law to this beautiful work of grace. You want to make it harder. I, I find some Christians that love to bring other people under law, and they make things more difficult. I'm like, hey, man, don't, don't add to it. God, there's plenty of challenge in God's word, just as it is. You don't have to add your whole group of rules here, right? So I don't need to make it more narrow. Way is narrow. I know it's narrow. It's narrow without you making it narrower but some people that are law-oriented, that's the, what, what they want to do. They want it to go to the right. Well, if to, a little bit to the right is good, then a way, you know, go way far to the right. Now, what's it mean to go to the left? It means to broaden the way, become liberal. Oh, yeah, you know, obedience doesn't matter. Cheap grace, just live however you want. And so what they do is they make it broader. There's a tremendous temptation in your life, depending on how you're wired, to move towards law, that's some of your tendencies. And some of you have the tendency to be <laughs> too liberal. God's word is right down the middle. He said, this is the way you live life. To the right, it's going to be no good for you. Law kills, man. Don't, you ever see a legalistic church? They just die. They shrivel up from the inside out. They make everybody poster children. Everybody's got to look exactly the same. And the girls have to have the same look and the same dress. And it's just like you just see it and it just smacks. It just shouts, law. And I want to run the other way. I'm like, no. The legalists are after us. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are those who try to broaden the way. Oh, you know, homosexuality is okay and all these different things. You know what? No, the, the, God's word is real clear. I don't have to make God's word stricter or narrower or firmer. It's, it's, it's plenty good. He wrote the book. Just leave, let him be the author and you be the follower. Don't be you trying to be the editor. Okay? Making it more, you know, right or left. So, he tells Joshua, all people need to be encouraged in obedience of God's people. In verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do it according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So the book of the law, or the word of God, um, shall not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it. Three things. You're going to be... You should be talking about God's word in your life. You should be thinking about God's word in your life. And you should be doing God's word. And the result of me talking about God's word and thinking about God's word and doing God's word is prosperity and success. Because God knows how to make it work. You'll prosper and succeed in your marriage. You'll prosper and succeed in your finances. You'll prosper and succeed in your um, uh, work endeavors or ministry, whatever it is. Why? Because God knows how to make things work. And those who discover the owner's money, I know this because when, when I buy a piece of equipment, I'm always one of these guys, oh, I'll just figure it out by the picture. And, and I get halfway, I get extra parts. I, and, uh, but my son's the opposite. The first thing my son, you know, he, he delicately unwraps whatever, he finds the owner's manual, and he sits down and he reads it. And that's slow, and he gets the job done, and he goes, okay, now. Let's proceed to the next thing. He, he knows how the owner, the, the guy that made the thing, he wrote the book. He knows how it works. I'm like, I don't know. That part doesn't look important. You know, I can, I, I'm not that way with the Christian life in God's word, though. Okay? I'm that way when I get the gadget at the store. And so what needs to happen is that God's word, if you know it, you'll start talking about it. And if you know it, you start thinking about it. What does God's word say? And it says, the word meditate means to murmur. And so I'm thinking about God's word. I'm like, yeah, you know, like I shared with you earlier. Or like we sang that song, which, you know, all things work together for good for those who know God and love, uh, love God and are called according to his purposes. Romans 8, 28. You're just murmuring, you know, you're muttering, you're, th you're thinking about that word. And as you're muttering it, you're contemplating it, you're thinking about it, it just begins to resonate with your soul, the truth of it. And then you want to apply it to your life. I think about, you know, uh, whatever it might be, there's so much of God's word. Um, Owe oh, no man anything except that debt of love. Um, a, a borrower is the slave to the lender. C a couple of ones that have to do with finances. 
And I think, man, you know, it could be just it, God's desired it for me to get out of debt because that would make me a freer person. I wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be a slave to a lender if I, could, if I could get out of debt. And so it motivates me in a direction, you know what I mean? As I'm thinking about it, as I'm talking about it, uh, I'm observing it, I'm seeking to be obedient to whatever it is. To, the Bible says to love my neighbor as myself. What would that look like if here this person, I, I'm in a difficult situation, this person came up to me and he asked me these questions, I'm not sure what to do. As soon as I put it through that filter, I often when I'm just sitting there and people are laying things on me, I think to myself, what do I want somebody to do for me? And then, boom, it's really clear. Because all I had to do is think, how would I want to be loved in this situation if I love my neighbor as myself? It solves 95% of the questions that I have about what would I do. I just think, this is how I would like to be loved in this situation. And so I'm observing it. And what it does is it makes you prosperous and successful in whatever that is. Now, there's a huge area of, of, of Christianity that is into, uh, you know, the prosperity doctrine and the health and wealth and all of those things that, you know, God wants everybody to be healthy and he wants everybody to be wealthy and, and these things. And, and it doesn't wash with certain passages of scripture. But the one thing that I will grant them is they are people usually that are motivated by faith. And it is a good thing to trust God in a great way. But uh, uh, it becomes skewered or twisted or bent. But having said that... Uh, I want you to be really clear that God talks about success and prosperity according to his owner's manual. If you want to do it, this is how you do it. How do you do it? Oh, you've already forgotten. Well, you read God's word, you think about God's word, you talk about God's word, you want to be obedient to God's word, and what is the fruit of that? Prosperity and success. Because I begin to be the person that God wants me to be. You begin to be the person that God wants you to be. Isn't that awesome? Well, in verse 9, uh, you need to resist fear and walk in faith. Verse 9, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? This is the third time he's told him this. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's almost as if he didn't maybe miss the first two times and the Lord says three times that he wants him to be uh, strong and of good courage and not to be afraid nor dismayed. What does that tell you? That he is maybe discouraged, he is maybe afraid, he is maybe dismayed. Being dismayed is kind of uh, fear and discouragement on steroids. When you're just dismayed, you're just like, I'm almost, or you just surrender. You just, uh, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. Uh, I'm too afraid. I can't do it. And, and you might be in a place in your life that for whatever reason, the Lord is prompting you to take a step of faith in a certain area of life, and you want to take that step of faith. You believe God's encouraging you to take that step of faith. The Lord's even given you some promises for his word about that step of faith, but you know what? Right now, you're afraid. You need somebody to come along and put their arm around you and say, hey, be strong, man. Be of good courage. I'm with you. The Lord's with you. I don't have to be afraid when I know God's with me. You know when you grew up, did you ever have one of those conversations, my dad's bigger than your dad, my dad can beat up your dad kind of conversation? I used to have those conversations as a little kid because I had a couple of, not only my dad was a tough guy, but, you know, my stepdad was an ex-con, he, he'll shoot you. So, uh, you know, I had a couple of <laughs> scary, scary things that I could use in that way. But when I was with them, I was never afraid because they were my dad. It's sad, you know, your dads are your hero till I, I don't know what the age is. Is that like uh, 11 or something and where dad stops me and cool? <laughs> uh, but the thing is, is that um, fear, fear and faith cannot cohabitate. When, when, when I'm overwhelmed with fear, faith goes out the door. And, and when faith comes in the door, faith goes, uh, 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 fear flees. God wants us to be motivated in our decisions by faith rather than fear. In verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the camp, command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. You need leadership structure and good communication uh, 
uh, in your uh, leadership. And, and that just brings encouragement from top to bot bottom. And Joshua's going to command the officers, and the officers are going to go ca command the people. So Joshua's the leader. Then he has his echelon of, uh, of officers, and they're going to communicate with all the people. And he tells them in three days, everybody get ready. Get provisions ready. We're going to cross the Jordan. Now, you have to understand, they're right at the Jordan. It's springtime, and the Jordan is flooding uh, I don't know if you've remembered, if you've been around Idaho Falls, you know the years of when we've had the high water mark and it's flooding and water's in the, uh, overflowing its banks, water over by the West Bank, I think it's the Red Lion now, but water all the way up to in the grass almost to the road uh, back in 97 when we had that really high water year. And when you think of the Jordan River, don't think of the Snake River or the Columbia or the Mississippi. Actually, when you get to, <laughs> this is funny, when the tour bus gets along the Jordan, because now so much water is taken out of the Jordan for human consumption in the land of Israel, it's like, they, there's the Jordan. You're like, it's a ditch. <laughs> it's a canal. I mean, it's, it, it's really, it's really uh, uh, small. We crossed over the, at the Allenby Bridge. General, it's named after General Allenby, but the Allenby Bridge to go into the, the country of Jordan. And you're going across this thing. It looks like a, a ditch uh, in one of our canals that you would cross over. But at that time, without the human consumption, the water was at flood stage, and it's overflowing its banks. It's, it's, you know, it's out in the bushes. It's, it's everywhere. And they're, as a camp, they're sitting there watching the overflowing Jordan, and he says, in three days, we're crossing that. Everybody's like, well, notice there's no instruction. Hey, start making rafts. You who, you who can build, make a raft. You who need floaties, go to the Walmart, get some floaties. <laughs> you who can swim, start doing some exercise. Get ready to swim. He doesn't say anything. He said, we're going to cross the Jordan. He doesn't tell them how. We know that just like the Red Sea parted and they went across on dry ground, the Lord's going to stand up the Jordan River and they're going to walk across. So he says, you know what? You don't have to build a raft. You're not going to have to swim. You're not going to be freaked out, you who are terrified of water. You don't have to need your little rubber floaties. Just this is the plan. Just, just trust the message of the leader. God is the leader. His human leader is Joshua. He's got officers. He's got the... the uh, they're going to communicate with the people. So, in verse 12, And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest and has given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them. Until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. Which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. There were two and a half tribes that got their inheritance on the eastern side of the Jordan. This is them. The Reuben... Uh, Gadites, uh, the Reubenites, Gadites, and half tribe of Manasseh, and this is calling up the reserves. They had made a promise. We, if they asked Moses, "Can we settle over here if we go in before the children of Israel?" Kind of like reserves. They made a promise. They're going to go to battle, and he said, "Now remind them of that, because some people that make grandiose promises. It happens to me. People will be at church. Hey, pastor, you know, I have this heavy equipment or whatever it is. They'll offer something. They'll say, anytime there's a need, here's my name and phone number. I just want to help out. So a month later, something comes up. Like, hey, name and phone number, card right here. Here we go. Call them up. Nada. Not going to help out. Don't have time. Da da da. da whatever it works out. Say, well, that didn't work out." And so sometimes people think that they're going to make promises that nobody's going to call upon, right? They just think they're going to make promises that nobody's going to, hey, man, don't, don't put it out there if you don't plan on following up and doing it. Don't tell your buddy you're going to help him move and then stand him up. And so, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. So this is their deal. In verse 16, so they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us we will do and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. 
Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that your, uh, you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. They answered Joshua. Man, this is, when you have good leadership and your leadership is encouraged and you share the vision with the leaders that are underneath you to share with the people, there's good morale. We know the strategy. We know what we're going to do. Morale's awesome. It's really good. And uh, they say, you know what? Wherever you command us, we're going to go. Whatever you say to do, we're going to do. If you send us here, we're going there. And, and just like we followed Moses, we're going to follow you. And if anybody rebels against you, we'll put them to death. Now, you know you have a good team when they're willing to kill for you. Okay, <laughs> we'll take them out. If they're going to rebel, they'll die. You know, uh, obviously we don't want anybody to die, but good leaders produce people, good leaders produce people that would chop off their right arm to do whatever they can for them. We see it in the life of David. David says one night, he's outside the walls, of, uh, he's outside of Bethlehem, and, and they're fighting with the Philistines, and they're battling, and he just, he's leaned back, and he grew up in Bethlehem, and the well water there, he just remembered as a kid, he grew up just cool and fresh, and they're out here, and they're bivouacked, and, and, and they're, you know, in this battle, and David says, man, what I would do for a drink of cold water from the well of Bethlehem, oh, that's so good, it's just, oh, it's just one of those um, Wonderful memories. Well, three of his guys, they don't say anything. They just get up. They go away. They hack their way through the enemy lines. They go all the way down there. They get a bucket of water. They come back. They're pounding blood all over them. They said, here you go, boss. You want that drink? Now, David, this had to be the, one of the most disheartening pictures in all the scriptures. David, he looked at them, and he realized they just risked their lives. And he said, man, you, you, you guys just risked your life for me. There's blood. I mean, you could have died for this. I was, I was just reminiscing. And, and, he, and he pours it out. Those guys just gave their life for it. But he gave them the greatest compliment. He said, Lord, only you are worthy of a drink like this. I give it to you. You see... When there's good leadership, man, people will chop off their right arm. That's what they're going to do for Joshua. That's what they did for David. That's what people, the servants of the Lord, all of them died for the Lord Jesus. He said, go into all the world and tell them this gospel. And all of the apostles, save one, John the, John the apostle, died brutal deaths because he was their leader, man. He died for them. He rose from the dead. He's the king. And he's the greater than Joshua. You see, Jesus, his name is Joshua. And I would follow our Joshua, the Lord Jesus, to hell and back because of what he's done for me in my life. And I pray that your Joshua, your Lord Jesus, that that's the kind of life you want too. Tonight we get to celebrate him. We remember his body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed for us. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, Lord, as we prepare and our worship team comes and the servants team comes and, and we, we just want to remember you, Lord Jesus, and what you've done for us. We pray that your spirit and your grace would just move here tonight. Lord, we've talked a lot about your promises and experiencing this expansive inheritance of you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that work. I pray that tonight would be that first step of the sole of our foot going into areas of life that we can really experience your goodness. Lord, as we partake of communion, we just ask that your spirit and your presence would be tangible, Lord. Will you move upon us as we sing to you, as we remember you, as we honor you with our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.